Hey, Acts chapter 4. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Uh, we here are just going through a, a series, uh, going through the book of Acts. Um, this is somewhat of a long series. And here we're in chapter 4. And what we're going to do today, for those of you that were here last week, uh, is we're reading the exact same verses we read last week. Because it's, there's just a, an entirely new message in these verses that I think we should talk about. Um, and if you, if you missed a bunch of messages or you missed a few weeks or something, please watch the videos online. Not just because we want more views online or anything like that. But there really is a purpose for it because all of our messages run together by, because of how we do this. We're just going through the book of Acts, verse by verse. And so it's not like we have these standalone messages. They all end up blending together as we learn about the early church. So if you get time, go back and watch, watch what you've missed. Today we're in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. So let's read this. It says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And that right there, that was last week's message. We talked about how this, the early church, these believers, they were all together in, in, of one heart and one soul. They had the same goals. They had the same focus, the values, the mindset, their priorities. That was their focus. And the thing we wanted to emphasize last week was, was that having that kind of unity doesn't mean sameness. There wasn't a mold that all of these new believers had to fit into. This is a, if you go back and you look at the people that Jesus called as disciples, that gives us a small picture of what the larger church looked like then and even what it looks like now. Because I'm going to tell you this, like I, I know some of you, I know some of you kind of well, I know some of you way too well. <laughs> But I know this, this right here, you guys, you're a messed up, dysfunctional group of people. <laughs> Seriously. And, and here's the deal. No no, listen, it's exactly like they were. That's what we got to understand. The early church, we are a picture of what the early church looked like. Because look at the disciples that Jesus called tax collectors. Fishermen, average people, look at the people he hung out with that he ministered to that we know got saved. Prostitutes, alcoholics, sinful people. That's who Jesus called and that's who makes up this multitude of those who believe. We have this idea that, that this multitude of those who believed that they all walked around in flowing robes and that they were perfect religious people. And it's wrong. Listen, we are the picture. We know this. People have not changed since the beginning of time. We, we're, the, we're still the same. Now, some of our habits might look a little different. Our cars might be a little faster. The technology is a little different. But in the heart, people are people. And that's the thing. We make up a messed up dysfunctional church just like they did. But here's what it says. They all came together in one accord with one voice because they knew Jesus. You see, that's the thing that takes all of us messed up dysfunctional people, some more than others. Yeah, I know. But it's really true. The thing that binds us together it's the blood of Christ. The one heart and the one mind. What comes together is this. People need to, join, they need to know Jesus. That's what brings them together. Our past, not important. What God's interested in is where's your heart today. That's it. Today, you can surrender your heart to Jesus and start from this day on. And I'll tell you what, it'll be the ride of your life. <laughs> it's awesome. Let's keep reading. It continues on in verse 32. It says, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You know, that's another prayer we should be praying. Lord, would you, with great power, allow me to testify to the resurrection of Jesus? It says this, And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And we'll stop right there. There's this idea in here of the church taking care of the church. Do you see that? This is believers that they're talking about. And sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, and I I even know in my messages I can become very guilty of this, where I challenge us, That we need to love people because they need to know that God loves them. That we need to love the people outside of the church. We need to love unsaved people. That we need need them to know that God loves them. Amen? Amen? Just like He loved you before you knew Him. God still loved you. And He loves them. And so for me, it's easy to stand up here and I get all worked up about that. Come on, church, we gotta love people. But here's the thing. understand something. I do think that's true. We should love people. But there's something in the Scriptures, actually it's in the Scriptures a lot, where we're told to love one another. And you see, this is where I think, and this is the part I'm guilty of. Sometimes we forget that we're supposed to love one another too. Sometimes, and and maybe it's just me, (laughs) because listen, of all the messed up dysfunctional people, top of the list right here. (laughs) Sometimes it's easier for me to love the drug addict or the alcoholic that comes stumbling in than it is to love some of you. But the Bible tells us that we ought to love one another. Matter of fact, it says it over and over again. And that today is it's what our message is about. And I have to be honest with you about this too. Today is, it's, you know, I like challenging messages. I like to challenge the church. I really do. I like to get all worked up and, and I like to challenge. And that's because I like to be challenged. I like when I read the scriptures, I like that, that through the scriptures, I think God is constantly stepping on my toes. He's constantly challenging me. And I, and I think that that I, one of the reasons I like that so much is because in our culture, we're so afraid to offend anybody. We don't want to step on anybody's toes, and, and therefore, we just kind of wander about. And, and so that, that's what makes me even more so want to say, hey, let's be challenged. But today, I, I just can't do that. And part of the reason why I just can't do that is because as we learn about the early church today, and this is the first point of a three-part message, or three-point message, here's the first point. Here's why I can't get all worked up and challenge us, because I think we do this. I think we're doing it. We are, we're learning from the early church, and as I look at how they love each other and how they care for each other, listen, I think we do that. And I think we do that really well. And so today, it's not so much about, well, there's a little challenge, but the challenge is this, let's keep doing what we're doing, because listen, it's working because it's ministering to people. And it's ministering to people because it's the way God tells us we should be doing it. And imagine what happens when we listen to the one who created it. Surprising. It works. The first point, we're doing it. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn in your Bibles to James chapter 2. And I, and I hope that you brought your Bibles. If you come to church here very often, please bring your Bible with because... Man, I'll tell you, less than a handful of times throughout the course of a year, will you come to church here when I want to ask you to open your Bibles? We are all about reading the Scriptures here. So in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, and and in this this book, James, uh, James is kind of, a, I think, a hard hitter, pretty direct. There's some pretty challenging things in the book of James, but I love it. (laughs) And in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14... He kind of continues with this idea that if we have faith, something should come out of that faith. 
James 1.22, for example, he says, Do not just be hearers of the word and deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Out of this faith, out of the scriptures, there should come action. Amen? Amen. James chapter 2, starting in verse 14, says this, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled... But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And and so I want to stop right there because here's what I want us to see is this. Is that God being inside of us produces something, right? The, The Bible says this. When Jesus is asking, you all know this, I'm just reminding you of this. When Jesus asks, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, the single greatest commandment is to do what? Love Love the Lord your God with, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your strength. And the second, listen, and the second is like it. What does that say? And to love your neighbor as yourself. To love God and to love people. And you see, this is why I get excited about this message. Because I look out and I say, hey, we do this. We love God. Don't we? I mean, we love God. We don't look at our faith as just this Sunday morning, hey, let's go, let's go just feel warm and fuzzy. No, you know what we come to do? We come to corporately worship the Lord. And how many of you know this? You can do this in a pole barn. Right? You can do this in somebody's basement. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm a little excited about the possibility of someday us having to cram into somebody's basement. Because I think it'll push the passion to the surface. And how exciting would that be? We love God. Our t- the, the worship this morning at all of our services. It's like, man, we, get, we are part of a church we love God. We're not afraid to, to confess our love for God, to proclaim our love for God. I look over and I think out of the corner of my eye, Dean's up here to pray. When we're singing, he is worthy, Dean's on his knees over here, right? Did I see that right? On his, here's a man who loves Plato, <laughs> but that's an entirely different conversation. Listen, he's unashamed to hit his knees in worship to his God. He doesn't care what you all think. Because that's this place. We love God. And then guess what? We love people. The number of times I hear from people who visit this place, what I hear more than anything is about you guys. About how friendly you are. How welcoming you are. Why? Why? Because you take your love for God, you accept Him into your heart, you allow Him to change you, and guess what happens? Even, and I know some of you, some of you really don't like people. I know that. I know that for sure. But you know what I see you doing? I see you letting God change your heart. All of a sudden, I see you talking to people. It's like, yep. It's the love of God the Spirit of God, the presence of God changing us. Faith, that true, genuine relationship with God, it causes there to be action. And that's what's happening here. We are at a place where we take care of one another. This big, messy, dysfunctional family brought together by the love of God, the blood of Christ, caring for one another and it is like 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 I can I don't have the vocabulary because I'm a simple person I don't have the words to tell you what it does inside of me to be part of this do you know why because we are being like the early church 2000 years ago the people who saw Jesus after he rose from the dead The people who saw the lame man stand up. and I mean, these are the people. Guess what? We're like those people. That is an encouraging thing to me. It's like the Bible says 
This is what we should be living like. And it's happening here because of our love for God and our love for people. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. You guys, I can get so passionate about this topic today. I can't even tell you. I can get so passionate about it. 1 John chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles there. Please don't get tired of turning pages because we, we're going to go through a few today. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 16, says this. It says, By this we know love, because he, he being Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Listen, the brethren. The fellow believers, the church, it's about loving each other. He goes on and he says this, But whoever has the world's good, whoever has these worldly possessions, and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's like, where is the love of God if we are not willing to help each other with our needs if we have the means? That makes sense? He goes on and he says this, he says, My little children... He says, let us not love in word. Listen to this now, this is important. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. What is he saying there? He's saying, let your actions show your love. Isn't that what he's saying? Don't just have empty words. Here's the deal. I don't know about you, but I think we live in a world where we've taken the word love and we've just diminished its power. Because we we say things like, man, I love my new shoes. I got some hey dudes. Are they hey dudes? I got some hey dude shoes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I had, yeah, they're so comfortable. They were on my desk last week after church because Denise got them for me and she had somebody pick them up. And so after church, I had worn my boots both services and and I I got some nice boots. But by the time service is done and being as old as me, I walked in there and my feet are throbbing and I see these these slipper looking shoes on my desk and it was like heaven itself opened up. And it it was like... Oh, you know, there was a light on these. It was, I sat down. The lobby's full of people. I didn't care. I sat down. I slipped my boot. I felt like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> I slipped my boots off and I put these on and it was like, come to Papa, you know? Oh my gosh, sir. But we use these terms. Man, I love my new shoes. I love my new truck. Have you seen my, I love my new motors. Have you seen that motorcycle? I love that motorcycle. I love, and we, we take this, and we take this word love, and then, and then to take that idea even farther, what we end up doing is this. We are a culture and a society who is filled with empty, listen to me, who's filled with empty words. We throw the word love around and then there's no action to go with it. How many of us have been told by somebody else how much they love us, but then there's no action to go with that? And you see, that's what the Bible's telling us. To the brethren, it's saying, to one another, to the church loving the church, say, don't don't do this in word alone. But do this in action. Show each other. And this is the deal. Man, we, we follow the example of God. Isn't that right as a Christian? Don't, don't we want to look at God and be like, man, I want to be like Jesus, right? Isn't that true? That's my understanding of the Bible, but I'm wrong all the time, so who knows? But we want to be like Christ. Amen. Well, guess what God does? In, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, don't turn there, but jot it down and go read it. Romans 5, 8 says this, that God demonstrates his love. You see, God doesn't tell us he loves us with empty words. God says he loves us and that his love is unconditional. He says his love endures forever. And then God shows us, he demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he sent his son 
Jesus for us. You guys, that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what we do. Again, I can't get all worked up and say, come on, let's go. All I can do is get worked up and say, we're doing it. Let's keep doing it. Let's not let any outside influence or inside influence keep us from loving one another. Because that's what God tells us to do. Turn in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 15. John, chapter 15. John chapter 15, starting in verse 9. John 15, 9. It says this. By the way, if you happen to have a Bible that you're not really familiar with and you see there's red letters in there, those red letters mean those are words that Jesus spoke. That's what the red letters mean. John 15, verse 9 says this. As the Father loved me, now this is Jesus speaking, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. The things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now that's a big deal. Jesus is saying to the church, love one another as he has loved us. Well, okay, how does he love us? He loves us, he loves us, he loves us with an unending love, an unconditional love, but he also loves us with the love that he shows, doesn't he? He he shows us that love. And in church, that's what we need to keep doing that. Turn back just a page to John chapter 13, verse 31. John 13, 31 says this. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews... Where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now I want you to stop right there because here's what I want you to see is this. I look at the importance of us loving one another and I get to see the fruit of that. When someone is in need, I see the church coming alongside and helping them. When someone is struggling, when someone needs prayer, all of this is what the church does. But here's another component to us loving one another. How we treat one another as believers is a testimony to other people about Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what this next verse, verse 35 says. By this, by your love one for another, he's saying. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, it's not just us being there for one another, helping each other. It's also a witness to those that are outside. Listen, we're doing this. Let's keep doing it. Amen? Amen. 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 Did I tell you this is a three-point message? Point two. The thing that sticks out about this to me also is this point two, the importance of being part of a body. The importance of being part of a body. This is, and again, as I get older, whatever it is, I get more and more the realization, the understanding that this is a family. Again, I'm well aware, messy and dysfunctional, but it is a family. How many of your own families, your blood families, are messy and, no, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to ask you that question. (laughs) But it's really true, though. That's in, in the importance of this. I, I know I hear from a lot of people, well, you know, they've been hurt by the church or whatever. I don't need to be part of a church. You know what? You, you don't. You don't need to be part of the church to go to heaven. You don't. You just need to believe in Jesus, right? That's salvation. But then what I say is, but hold on. You don't need to be part of it, but boy, are you missing out by not being part of it. Now, we are all part of the larger body of Christ, but to be a part of a, of a local church, 
A church that impacts the community, a church that reaches out, a church that, that helps, that loves, that comes. I mean, this is something that, man, this is unbelievable to get to be a part of this. To worship together is so good. The importance of the body of Christ sticks out. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to start reading in verse 19. You know, this is where I, 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 I think a lot about this, and I think I might have already said this in the service, I'm not sure, but I think about us meeting together. Never stopping meeting together. I did, I did kind of start talking about this. So I'm, I'm excited. That's what I was saying. I'm a little bit excited about the day when we're told we can't meet together. If that comes. If it comes where we're told we can't meet together. I'm a little bit excited about that. Because, because I want to see. And here's what I think is this. I think that we'll see a new level of passion and a new level of, of faith and drive come out of people. Because I, I, in my mind, what I have picturing, like Jerry's pointing at this basement, I'm not thinking we'll meet in this basement. No, no. I'm thinking we're going to meet in Mike and Barb's pole barn. I'm thinking we're going to meet in Jerry and Sandy's basement. That this is what's in my head. And what I'm curious to see is this, is how many of us go to that. And, and it... And, and, in my head, it's like, I, I know this because, because this place is so awesome. I know it's not just going to be us two and whoever we talk into hosting. I think that we're showing up for church wherever church is held because we understand the importance of being together. We understand the importance of the body of Christ the importance of showing up, the importance of worshiping together. Doesn't it encourage you when you hear other voices worshiping? I know it does me. I know it does Denise. To hear your voices lifting up, he's worthy, is moving to me. To hear that thunderous, he is worthy. And then when it switches to you are, it's like we need that. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 19, says this. It says, therefore, brethren... Again, to the church, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Just simply saying, Jesus has made a way by his body, his blood on the cross, for us to have access to the holiest of holies, to that inner place where we have access to the Father. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Man, you should underline that because as the challenges come, as the temptations come, we have to be resolved to hold fast without wavering our confession of the hope we have. And let us consider, this is verse 26, or verse 24 now. And let us consider one another. So here, look at the context of the writer, what he's doing. He's talking about our access to God the Father through the blood of Jesus, through the body of Christ. We have access to the Father. He's talking about not wavering in our confession. And in the context of that, listen to this now, in the context of that, he also says, and let us consider one another. Do you think that the body is important to God? Do you think that our relationship with one another is important to God? I do. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as we see the day approaching. You see, some, as the Bible says, some are getting in the habit of not meeting together. Some have stopped meeting together. The Bible knew this was going to happen, right? God knew this was going to happen. That's why it's in there. Just like the Bible says, in the last days, people are going to go 
where they hear what their itching ears want to hear. We just want to feel good. You know what? I don't want to feel good. I want to bring glory to God and reach people. I don't care about my feelings. Be honest with you. (laughs) I'm not too concerned about your feelings either. (laughs) (laughs) Dean told me earlier. I said, man, I didn't, because I was first, I don't know why, man, you're just on my radar. First service, I was making a little bit of fun of Dean, and, and so between services, I was like, man, I, I didn't hurt your feelings, did I? He says, nope, I got one left, and that's still in my back pocket. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> but that's really what we do, is we, we, and it's happening. You all know it's happening. You know people are going places where they just hear what they want to hear, not interested in what God's truth has to say. And in the same way, people will stop meeting together. The body, this right here, is of utmost importance, especially more and more as we get closer to the day of His return. To spur one another on, to encourage one another, and to challenge one another. Proverbs 27, 17, jot it down. It says, iron sharpens iron. And as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another man. Listen, that's the benefit of the body, isn't it? We encourage one another. We challenge one another. We rub on one another. We sharpen one another. That's the reality of it. Even when it gets uncomfortable, we stick to it because the body is important. The first point today is we're doing it, man. We, we're, we're like the early church. We are supporting one another. We come alongside one another when we hear there's a need. The second point, we're understanding the importance of the body. But, but then there's this third point. And this third point is called this, the rest of the story. I've heard it said by pastors much older than me, much more experienced than me, that most sermons are basically only half-truths. The reason that, some of you, you just scowled right now. <laughs> Let me finish my sentence for crying out loud. You hurt my feelings. <laughs> the reason for what, what he's saying is this. It's like you share a truth, but you don't always have time to fully expound on that truth to show, if you will, both sides of the coin in its fullness. Today, I want to take an extra couple minutes Because I want to talk about the other side of this coin today. The rest of the story. When we talk about being benevolent, when we talk about helping one another out, sometimes that can be a hard conversation because we look at our possessions, our money, our things as, but that's mine. Mine, 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 mine. (laughs) <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. What am I talking about? Yes, finding. Thank you. Last night at the 4:30 service, I I went into this long like I I brought I tried to show everybody like paint a picture of this exact scene. You know, there's Dory and Marlin and they're on the dock and and the the big pelican thing, he's trying to save them and all of a sudden the seagulls spot these little fish on the dock and one of them goes You guys must be great when you go to a comedy club. (laughs) Take the punchline. But yeah, mine. And then another one, mine. And then it just goes and goes and goes. Well, sometimes that's the exact same mindset we can have. Not you guys. But it's the mindset we can have, listen, with our stuff. (laughs) Created a monster. But do you guys understand what I'm saying, though? And so what we want to do is we we want to not have that mindset. But because of experiences in the past, maybe 5, 10, 20 years ago, maybe you were extremely generous with people at your church. But then you realize, wait a minute, these people are just taking taking advantage of me. They're just, they're not, they're not changing anything. They're just taking advantage of me. And so you get to a point where you get calloused. And my, my fingers, from playing guitar, if you play guitar, you know this, you get calluses on your fingers. The whole point of that callus is so that every time you play, it doesn't hurt. For some of us, we've gotten calloused in our hearts 
because we've seen stuff like this just get taken advantage of. We've even been guilted and shamed into giving or helping. You know, we have some people that they'll call the church looking for assistance. And just so you know, we're, we're generous. We want to help people. Whether it's our church, the local clergy association. But it's funny how it works because people kind of go down their list of the things they want. Like they'll call and they'll be like, hey man, I'm down on my luck. Is there anything you can do? Yeah, we can, we can get you 50 bucks for more worth of groceries. Will that help you out? No, I'm, I'm really just looking for some cash. Well, we can, we can fill your gas tank, and here's the deal. Filling a gas tank is no small gift today, right? <laughs> it's like, hey, gas tank, house payment, you know. But, but then they'll say, no, we, you know, if you could just you could give me 100 bucks cash, maybe. Well, we, we don't really do that, but we can, we can put you up in a room for the night if you need help staying somewhere. That's no 80, it's 80 to 100 bucks to do that locally. That's a good gift, I think, in helping people. No, we really just need, can you just give me 100 bucks cash? You know what, I'm sorry, but we really don't do that. And this sweet, soft-spoken person on that phone, all of a sudden, turns into a monster. <laughs> I thought you were a church. You're supposed to be Christians. I thought you were Christian there. Click. Not me. Them. Immediately people go to that. And I'm sure some of you have experienced that too when, when people are asking you for help. And, and, and I look out, I was like, man, you guys, I know you. You love people. You, you're generous with people. I know you are. But even in that, if you try and put up a boundary and say, hey, Wait a minute, man. I, I mean, I've been doing this over and over and over again. I'm not seeing anything changing. I, I don't think I can keep doing this. But I thought you were a Christian. I thought, but you're supposed to love people. And all of a sudden, you get this guilt and this shame. And what I want to encourage you with today is this. See, here's the thing. We have to be careful that we don't get calloused and we're, grow weary in doing good. I want to show you that it's okay to put up a boundary. It's okay to draw a line when it comes to helping the brethren. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 6. Uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 6. You see, being a Christian and, and helping people, being generous with people, it doesn't mean be taken advantage of. It doesn't mean do something that creates an, an unsafe environment. Ladies, you can have the tenderest, most generous heart, but please hear me. Don't put yourself in danger. Call the police or do something if you want to help somebody. Don't ever put yourself in danger. You got to be careful of these things. I heard it said years ago, Jesus came and he took away our sins. He didn't take away our common sense. We have to keep that in mind. Amen? Amen. You guys, you follow this? Yep. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's start reading in verse 6 real quick. It says, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that you withdraw from every brother, brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. But we worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. How many of you know this? Today? You all know what I'm going to say next, don't you? There's a lot of people that don't want to work. We look in our culture. We look in our society. There's jobs everywhere. You can get an $18 an hour job. When I drove truck, I, st I quit driving truck 16, 17 years ago, something like that. I was making $20 or $21 an hour, and I had been there 15 years. And I thought I was making a lot of money. Now, I think you can make close to that at Quick Trip. 
Listen, this, it's the world we're living in. And here's the thing. We have to be careful because that whole mentality, it's permeated the church as well. Where people don't want to work. Now, I, I understand there's the select few who can't. I get it. But to be a shorthand, this is an idea that's permeated the church as well. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. You're not working. Instead, what you're doing is you're stirring everything up. You, you, you spend all this time talking and spreading rumors, and, and you're just stirring all of these things up. He goes on and says this, Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and that they eat their own bread. This is iron sharpening iron. This is the uncomfortability of the Word of God. Saying those of you that are, if you're just lazy and you're just not working and you're just, what he's saying is this, get to work. Do something. And he's talking to the church. Do you all understand that? This is a message that's to the church in Thessalonica. This is a message that's for the church today, saying, go to work. You, you know, this guy right here, Ryan, you know this guy? He told me a few weeks ago, he came to me, he's like, I just want to thank God. Do you know why? Because I got a job, he said. Because I got a job, he said. He's excited and praising God. Do you know why? Because he'd been praying for a job. This guy. Paul is challenging those who, who are choosing not to work and instead are just being busybodies. He goes on in verse 13. And then he says this, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Don't get calloused. Don't stop helping people out because of those that are taking advantage of the system. Making sense to you guys? Yeah. Goes on in verse 14. And if anyone does not, now listen to this, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, in, in the letter, in the note he's writing, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother. So I want you to see the full picture of this before I let you go today. Paul's not saying hate that person. Paul's not saying that person is the enemy. What Paul is saying is this. Let's let iron sharpen iron. Let's challenge one another. Let's encourage one another. If you're picking up on a behavior from someone, it's like, man, you're, you're able to work. You're just, you're just taking advantage of the generosity of the church or the system. Come on. That's what he's saying. He's saying, let's, let's encourage one another. Let's challenge one another. Let's rub up on one another. Let's sharpen one another. But let's not do it as enemies. Let's not hate one another because of it. And this is the part we got to get better at in every church. Disagreeing doesn't mean enemy. Do you all understand that? Yes. It, what he's saying right here is, if you're going to correct him, listen, correct him as a brother. If Bill has to correct me, it doesn't mean that I'm his enemy. You know what it means? He comes to me in love saying, Brother Bill, you're... Brother Bill, Brother Bill. Hey, that's kind of fun. <laughs> but, but do you guys get that? Do you know what's missing from a lot of churches today? Is that right there. We get our undies in a bundle and we just leave. We run. Do you know what we need to do? We need to sit down and have a conversation. We need to sit down and talk. You know why? Because that's what the Bible instructs us to do. That's what Paul is saying. Hey, if you've got to correct somebody, correct them. Correct them like a brother. My brother and I, we've had some tough conversations. Guess what? We still love each other. My brother Dan and I, we've had some tough conversations. This guy, you can talk about difficult. I'm just <laughs> This guy is the difficult one. But listen, we still love each other. You see, that's, and that's what's so wonderful. Listen, when you, you, you have this generous heart, that's what Paul's saying. Don't stop doing good. That's what we're supposed to do. Love one another. Come alongside of one another. Help one another. Don't stop. Don't get calloused. Instead, when you see it being abused and taken advantage of, oh no, man. 
Admonish as a brother, as a sister. Amen? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, and you know what happens? We protect the body then. You see, we're doing these things. Let's keep doing these things. Let's protect what we have. Why? Because this is so stinking important and we need it. More and more, as the day approaches, we need to be gathering together. And let's be okay remembering the rest of the story. Let's be okay putting a boundary in place. Nobody can guilt us into things. We're going to do it right. Amen. Amen.